Welcome everyone. We are thrilled to have you commune with us on Valentine's Day, a day of love and warmth. My name is Adero Knott, she, her pronouns. I am the founder of AK Prosthetics and co-curator of the inaugural Evanston Art Center Curatorial Fellowship of 2020 through 2021. Alongside co-curator Alpha M. Bhutan of Phantom Gallery, Chicago. Ceremonial Teas in the context of African-American social life is our first curated experience as we explore how artists examine the state of their environment and society through themes of racism, spirituality, documentation, and art as wellness. Joining us, we have Julika Lachey, whose pronouns are they, them, as our American Sign Language interpreter. Our presenter for today is Larissa J. Akinremi, using she, her pronouns. Larissa J. Akinremi is a mother, visual artist, storyteller, filmmaker, social and cultural curator and mentor. She is the founder of The Social Move, an initiative and organization that provides extraordinary experiences for the everyday child through art, culture, technology, and mentorship. Akinremi's mission is to preserve cultural institutions, history, and artifacts, just like her mother, the late community activist, philanthropist, and preservationist, Bobble Johnson, notably recognized for saving the Rosenwald Building located in Chicago's Bronzeville neighborhood. She is a published writer and her photography has been featured in the High Park Art Center, Connect Gallery, and most recently, Phantom Gallery. Her practice also includes activating outdoor installations and public spaces. She was the past curator for Sounding Bronzeville, a gathering space curated by Norman Teague and Faux Wilson in partnership with the Bronzeville Community Development Partnership, Chicago Park District, and Field Museum. She has received her visual art certification from the University of Chicago Graham School and High Park Art Center in 2017, and has earned a certificate in 2020 from the Digital Storytelling Institute at the Logan Center. Our guest speaker is Torian J. Webb, he, him pronouns. Torian J. Webb is the director of the Center for the Church and the Black Experience at Garrett Seminary, where he also teaches in the field of religion and race. Currently, he is a religion and public life fellow in the Religion, Conflict and Peace Initiative at Harvard University, working to produce a traveling exhibition that centers visual artists from the African and Arab diasporas. As a researcher and teacher, Webb's research and teaching interests are in WPA, FAP, and Black Renaissance era visual arts, Black internationalism, Black Palestinian transnationalism, liberationist theological movements of the global South, and Cold War era UN politics. Webb's writing appears in Jadalia and Black Perspectives, and his work is supported by the Forum for Theological Exploration, the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference, and Columbia University Center on African American Religion, Sexual Politics, and Social Justice. Torian Webb is a proud graduate of Morehouse College with earned graduate degrees from Columbia University, New York, and Northwestern University, Evanston. He lives in Evanston, Illinois with his wife, son, and daughter. You may follow Webb on Twitter at Torian Webb and his creative productions on Instagram at TJW787. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Greetings. My name is Larissa J. Akinremi, and I am the presenter for Ceremonial Teas in the context of the African American experience. Thank you for joining me for today's event. Please have handy your hats, gloves, teacup and saucer, and favorite tea. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the presentation.
Ceremony is defined as a formal act of ritual or an observance of an occasion. It can be an elaborate gathering, such as a wedding or an individual act of solitude celebrating the spirit. The first mention of slave tea ceremonies comes from New Orleans, which had a sophisticated slave population with a taste for elegance and glamour. Many slave masters passed their old broken china to favored slaves. The original ceremony required that the hostess send the men of the house out to borrow china teacups and mugs from her neighbors. But before we discuss the ceremonial teas in the context of the African-American experience, it is important to note the origin of tea culture to the enslaved African. While history tells us that the tea story started in China around 2750 BC, missions of trade and exploration crossing the Indian Ocean between Africa and China made Africans aware of the tea made from leaves Camellia sinensis. The African journal written accounts of China's travels. The 14th century Moroccan scholar Ibn Battuta and his contemporary the Somali explorer Said of Mogadishu both discuss Chinese tea customs. Whether they returned home with samples of Chinese tea is unknown, but there are records of prestige goods, including tea, being exchanged during the meetings with African leaders, which took place as part of the Ming Dynasty voyages of Chinese Admiral Zing, whose fleet rounded the coast of Somalia and followed the shoreline down to the Mozambique Channel in the period 1405 to 1433. Tea is a plant or an herb. Enslaved Africans in America came with thousands of years of plant and herbal knowledge passed down from generation to generation. Many were root women and medicine men. According to Sade Muse of Roots of Resistance, African American herbalism is a rich melange of many cultural traditions with deep origins rooted in African history, dating back to ancient Egypt. It includes Arab and Asian practices that cross paths due to trade and cultural exchange on the African continent. As enslaved Africans people cross the Atlantic with the transatlantic slave trade, their herbal knowledge and practices were influenced as well as appropriated by European slavers. On one hand, Colonizers wanted enslaved Africans healing knowledge, especially when their own remedies were not working or European medicine was too expensive to import. But on the other hand, European colonizers also feared African root medicines and did not want enslaved people to be empowered in any way. For enslaved Africans, herbal knowledge was a tool for liberation and spiritual, emotional, and physical health. Highly sought after herbal supports could even be used as bargaining tools for freedom. Enslaved Africans were not allowed to celebrate Valentine's Day on February 14th, but were excused the next day, February 15th, and celebrated with broken teacups and saucers and leftovers scraps from their master's kitchen. They rejoiced and danced and clapped, sang songs and played the fiddle, a trade taught by the plantation owner to entertain guests for celebratory occasions. T 
tea culture and ceremony is significant in East, West, and North Africa. Tea is always served to visitors in African homes, but more commonly, it is drinking during social gatherings at restaurants, on street corners, in alleyways, and wherever people meet to talk and socialize. Morocco is considered the largest importer of green tea worldwide. Morocco consumes of green tea with mint rather than black tea. It has become part of the culture and is used widely at almost every meal. The Moroccan people even make tea performance a special culture in the flower country. Moroccan tea is commonly served with rich tea cookies, fresh mint leaves, local finger sheep, brown sugar, and colorful tea glasses and pots. Drinking Moroccan tea is not only a luxury of tongue, but also with the eyes. The Senegalese tea drinking custom is similar to those of other countries in the West African region, such as Guinea, Gambia, and Martinia. In and around Senegal, tea is prepared and presented in an elaborate process known in the Wolof language as Ataya. The ceremony can take place any time of day and just about anywhere, whether at work, at home or even in the streets, it's a crucial part of Senegalese social life. A tie is not a quick process. The whole thing can take up to three hours, but that allows for more time for friends and family to talk and catch up. It consists of black tea, fresh mint, and sugar. The first round is strong and takes some time getting used to. The second round is almost a perfect blend of tea, fresh, fresh mint, and sugar. The third is sweet and minty. In Côte d'Ivoire, Sudan, and even in Senegal, hibiscus tea, known as bisap, is popular in the countries. It's iced and sweetened with sugar. Bisap is a popular drink sold by street vendors on the beaches in Senegal and Côte d'Ivoire. Vendors sell the drink iced or frozen and often in plastic bags. Bisap is often flavored with fresh mint leaves or ginger. After slavery, during the turn of the 19th century, black tea rooms and houses were formed by black women, primarily because blacks were not allowed in white tea houses. Tea rooms in African American communities hosted important social events. Community leaders held them as badly needed establishments. Groups such as the NAACP, Women's Auxiliary, Black sports writers and the Negro Business League held luncheons and dinners at tea rooms. The Green Book, started by a resourceful black postal worker named Victor H. Green, provided listings and advertisements for businesses that served African Americans without hassle. Most of them were black owned, but not all. The book's publisher regularly solicited new entries from readers and correspondents. The 1940 edition contained 15 Pittsburgh listings, including seven hotels, three tourist homes, and one restaurant, Daring's Tea Room, that was located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and was established and opened from 1928 to 1948. Located in Miami, Florida, Georgette's Tea Room House opened in 1940 as a guest house and meeting spot 
for black entertainers and community activists. The two-story building with 13 rooms and 4,100 square foot house would serve breakfast, lunch, tea, and boarding to visitors and guests. It is remembered as a significant meeting place for Miami's black cultural community. Owned by Georgette Scott Campbell, the Tea Room in Brown Sub was a swank city for black organizations and it offered black entertainers a comfortable secluded retreat from the overcrowding at Overton. The ideal tea room was a chic and colorful feature of social life in Chicago. The ideal tea room was located at 3344 South Michigan Avenue. Whether the occasion was breakfast, dance, a reception or a banquet, sorority club or frat, there was scarcely a day that there was some exclusive function. It was owned by proprietor Mamie Lee Klinkskeld. Tea socials began to become popular in the black church. It was organized by the women of the church as an opportunity to fellowship, raise money, and discuss social and political issues. Black debutantes, balls, and cotillions was for black girls who made their debut to society and were generally the daughters of affluent doctors, lawyers, and teachers. Martha Mitchell, a retired educator, says during the early 1900s, the only way to become a debutante was through invitation. Debutantes were further distinguished in the upper realms of the black community. However, her family, particularly her father, received a social boost as well. The unspoken implication was that poise, beauty, popularity, and academic agility was a direct result of good parents who are also special because they achieved a certain status in order to bring forth such a daughter. Blacks never debuted to society and white cotillions, nor did white teens debut in society and black cotillions, and that is still prevalent even today. When dressing for a tea party, always remember to check the invitation first to determine how formal the tea party will be. For most tea parties, the appropriate dress code is smart casual. However, if you're having a tea at a posh hotel, the dress might tend to lean towards semi-formal. If the invitation doesn't specify, call the host and ask. Smart casual dress, is somewhat informal but in which you are still expected to be well dressed. This can mean anything from a dressy pair of pants and a nice shirt to a dress and heels. Feel free to express your style. Often ladies sport hats, gloves, and brightly covered suits and dresses. High tea dress is a tea dress also known as a tea gown which is suitable for high tea. The hemline is falling above the ankle and below the knee. Whether it's short or long sleeved, accessorize it with an endearing quilted crossbody bag for fashionable elegance. Black is never appropriate for a tea party. But today, anything goes. I've seen uh, several black tea formal wear being worn at events. Although the African-American tea ceremony was started by enslaved Africans in America on February 15th, the day after Valentine's Day, 
the tea ritual and customs preceded them centuries ago throughout the continent. This rich culture was remixed into American society and continues to be celebrated present day. Wow, that was amazing. Just absolutely amazing. Larissa, I have some, some questions for you that I want to uh, share with the audience. Um, if we could, uh, you know, have your camera on. All right, perfect. Now, Larissa, you mentioned in the beginning of your presentation that your father introduced you to African tea ceremonies. How did he instill within you the significance of creating rituals and ceremonies in your life? And how do you carry those rituals into your everyday practices? Okay, so my dad, um, to me, first of all, I should say that everything about my life is a ritual from the time that I get up, my sleep patterns, uh, uh, meditating, um, breathing and make everything a ritual um there there are too many um things in this world that is very serious um i've always found tea to be very comforting very warm an opportunity to regress in my thoughts to start the day i used to watch him a lot when he drank tea you know the process of of forming it, watching the cup, watching him put honey in the tea, watching him add milk. Um, it was a very methodical process and I was very um, enthralled by that. You know, I was kind of a very different kid. So um, he, uh, he just really influenced me um, in terms of drinking that. And so I kind of instilled that in my everyday life going forward. Although my tea practice, my tea ceremony and ritual is more elaborate because I like uh, lots of teas and I have pottery and um, I have tea dress, you know, and I wear the hats and gloves. Um, every day is ceremonious. Every day is to be celebrated, even if it's just a simple act um, to remember the spirit individual through the breath. Wow, that's wonderful. Now, we can definitely tell from the rich history of, of, of just global uh, tea ceremonies and especially the African tea ceremonies and African-American tea ceremonies. How can we preserve these rituals and ensure that their importance carries on for generations as it has for you? So first of all, um, let me go back. You know, in, in any practice, um, we have to find where the historical context came from. And in this country, uh, because our ancestors were enslaved, much of our um, practices have been um, erased. And we find ourselves in the present day where people are continuing to keep um, our history, our rich history, um, uh, erased and not teach it in schools and not find it as an equitable tool to teach African American students or other students of color. Um, it is important that we remember to go back. Um, it is important to find equity in Black and um, Indigenous culture. It is important for us to understand where we came from so I would encourage anyone, mother, father, foe, school, um, preacher, uh, imam, uh, Buddhist, 
you know, if you're, if you're going to practice anything, tell the story. There, 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 there is significance and importance in the story. So tell the story and tell it all. Most definitely. That definitely rings true. Um, that was just so amazing. And Larissa, you are absolutely correct. Um, you know, we're not learning about these, these rituals, um, these traditions. I didn't even know about the African American tea ceremonies and really how it was so prevalent um, in American history, not just Black history, but just American history as well. Um, so it's, I'm just so happy to have you here with us and to share that. And I'm, I hope that it was really um, insightful for everyone here to experience that. Yes, well, thank you. And do you mind um, just sharing with us, you know, your tea setup and just guiding us through you know, what you prepare for today? So, uh, so behind me, I have uh, different types of setups. Uh, uh, setups. I have. Um, a more, I don't. I don't know if you can really see them because the camera is not really on them. I have a Moroccan tea setup. Okay. Um, that's the traditional Moroccan tea setup. I have uh, the Deruda, which is from Italy. Um, I used to work. Well, I'm not. Gonna, I'm not going to name uh, the, the company that I used to work for. Uh, it no longer exists, but their pottery came from Deruda. So if you, if if the pottery was broken, you could take it. So I I took I bought some pieces, but I took a lot of the uh, broken pieces and glued them back together. So that was like 25 years ago. So I still have them in my collection. So that's here. And then I have a, a flowering pot um, where you use. Um, uh, I like green tea, but it's an actual flower and you put the okay. hot water in it and the flower blooms in the pot. So that's a green tea set, it's black. And then we have uh, an antique silver collection from the personal collection of Paula Danev. So thank you. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Again, thank you so much for sharing. Um, you know, your, your knowledge with us. We really appreciate it. And for bringing um, your, your personal tea collection. Okay. To the gallery. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And next we will have Torian joining us. Hi, everybody. Um, so so for, first of all, let me say um, uh, thank you to Larissa for, uh, for that phenomenal presentation. Um, it, it was extraordinarily exciting for, for me, very informative and my, my favorite part. Um, you know, what was your, your line there, Larissa, if you're going to tell the story, um, if you're going to practice something, tell the story and tell it all. Uh, so, so thank you for, for offering that to us. Thanks to Adero uh, for, uh, for the introduction and, and many thanks to Adero and Alpha and uh, Larissa and the others in the Evanston Art Center community uh, for welcoming me. You know, I, I, I was um, connected with Alpha a while back um, as she's one of the participating artists in a show that I'm producing at Harvard a little bit later this year. And when she was telling me about some of the work that you all are trying to do uh, there at the Evanston Arts Center and how that might impact uh, the Evanston community and broader Chicagoland community, I was, I was compelled, right? I was compelled and inspired. So I'm certainly thrilled to be able to come and fellowship with you all in, in this way. So I, I was asked to come and reflect with us for just a, a brief moment on how we might hold together, right? The, these oftentimes intersecting realities of race, spirituality, justice, lived experience, artistic expression. That's a tall order, it's a tall order, but I, but I want to, to take us on a bit of a journey through it. And, and I, I will start here. So my, 
My wife has spent a good amount of time in continental Africa, economic development work, some crisis management work, um, reimagining what we mean, what we think we mean by missions and humanitarianism, that sort of thing. And I remember a moment several years ago when I was on my way back, just returning home from some time that I spent in the Arab world, West Bank in particular, and how, how life-giving it was for me to be able to, to build with folks, build relationship with folks, entire families, entire families sitting in living rooms, in folks' homes, talking over Arabic coffee and tea. And I was explaining that there was, there was something that felt strangely familiar there. And it was a familiarity that I couldn't quite put my finger on. But I, I, I felt it in an unexpected way, almost, almost ancestrally, right? Felt it in my body, my body memory. And she said, well, you know, it, it sounds strikingly akin to West African tea culture. Right? Larissa talked about this a bit. Th this moment where, uh, where French and Arabic and local dialect speech all coming together, right? In these everyday, ordinary yet extraordinary moments of celebration, these rites of passage that, that cascade down through rounds of tea serving. I asked her to say more about it. She said, well, it, 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 it happened in, in such a way that the rounds of serving reflect the different rounds and the seasons of life. She said, well, in, in some of these traditions, Right, there's a, there's a bitter round, right, that, that reflects the challenges of youth. Then there's this slightly sweeter round that reflects the, the modest sweetness of midlife, with the final round being the sweetest, representing the, the joys of an entire life well lived. In preparation for, for this keynote, when I was reflecting back on, on this conversation, it took me back to a moment about two years ago, almost to the day in a Birmingham hotel. My, my family and I were in town at a conference, uh, my daughter being just around six months old. Some of the elders who were close to us encouraged us to have a traditional African naming ceremony, an important rite of passage, right? To mark entrance of this new child on this side of existence. So we did. My family and I, my, my mother was in town. We, we all dressed in white. The elders brought the elements. And as they prayed and offered blessings over the child, we allowed her to partake in some of the elements, right? The palm oil uh, for, for the future positive use of her spiritual energy, right? Her spiritual powers, the coconut, such that her love for material things will never overtake her, right? The, the, the water, so that she might always be renewed. The salt, such that uh, she might bring sweetness, everywhere in her life where there is bitterness. I, I enter us into this place from, from this point because these, these moments, right? These, these snapshots, they, they reveal to us such an important truth, right? And that is that in any of these moments, in any of our moments, we're in, in, in significant ways it, it, it seems that the world itself is, is shifting under our feet, right? Part of what foregrounds us, part of what brings us back to ourselves, part of what, what stakes us back into those values that mean so much is the sense that we were not alone, right? But we are a part, participants in. 
this, this wider continuum, right? That stretches across time and place and geography, right? Immemorial. It's a tradition grounded in a tradition. And so oftentimes it is creative culture that carries those traditions on. It is creative culture embedded in these, these ceremonial rites of passage that anchor our young. It's creative culture that embedded in the, in the body movements and, and the vocal riffs of our performative arts that harken back to these ancestral places. It's creative culture that's embedded in the visual arts that push us to be able to imagine and to, to see the world in ways that we would not have been able to otherwise. But that's not new, right? That ain't new. Many of us who are grounded in um, the Black US traditions in particular, we know this. James Baldwin told us this about music decades ago. Toni Morrison said it about literature decades ago. These creative mechanisms that help us access, right? They help us access things that our mere words and thoughts alone cannot. They take us to places that our mere words and, and thoughts themselves can never, never go. But what does any of it mean for today, right? So what? What does it mean for our right now? The fact is, we are still bound within a moment, trapped, right? Constrained within a moment overrun with mechanisms by which people, entire communities, entire communities are still denied the right to thrive and flourish. Entire communities. And, and in this Black History Month and every month, I think it's always on time to remember that part of what racism does, right? Part of what gendered and sexual, uh, uh, sexualized oppression does is it seduces us to believe that black and brown and non-heteronormative bodies and communities of color, truth claims are not as legitimate. Part of what white supremacy does is it seduces us into believing that communities' ways of being in the world, ways of knowing in the world, ways of engaging in the world are somehow not quite appropriate. Especially, they say, if y'all want equality. Part of what systems of oppression do is they force communities to find ways, to create ways, to give voice to the new world that must be born, must be made. This is one of the reasons that for, for me, street art, is is one of um, it's one of my favorite examples of this. I mean, we can we we can go right right down the street to 79th and Constance, right? I'm 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 speak, I'm in Chicago language, right? Stony, right? And and literally see and and feel and hear the ways in which community Pilsen, right? The ways that communities disinvested by the city are literally carving out and sketching out and and tagging tagging out their own freedom dreams. And if we open ourselves, people like me and you and my children and, and, and children in all of our communities can participate in different ways in that vision casting, right? One of the greatest gifts I think of creative culture is that it can create bonds of kinship where none existed otherwise. But what then 
might this mean for us? EAC community, right? I raise that question as someone, excuse me, who has, who has taught and worked in Evanston for several years and, and as someone who cares a great deal about the community here, I also raise that question as a type of challenge and, and an invitation, right? With a recognition of what it means to be in this moment that we now inhabit for the past several years. Black and brown bodies, differently gendered bodies, differently abled bodies, have been under assault in, in these United States in, in particular with impunity. Again, that, that's, that's not new, this ain't new. But what is new is, is, is that it is a newly um, visualized reality in the national consciousness, right? Of everybody, every community, every institution, such that institutions everywhere, everywhere are now trying to hurry and make all these concessions, right? We, we, wanna, we wanna center black bodies here. We wanna privilege black voices over there because they're being forced to, if they want to remain on the right side of history. And the arts world is not exempt. All across this country, Museums, galleries, collectors, curators are just now starting to take seriously the, the, the craft, the craft of black art making beyond the household names. The question is how we do this in a way that moves beyond the tokenism. How we do it in a way that moves beyond, you know, where we, we will include this voice because it's the socially acceptable thing to do, it's cool. Right, that's, that's the question, that's the ethical question. And we start to answer that question ethically by asking other sorts of questions. Who's on your board of directors? Who is in your decision-making rooms? Where's the money go, right? We know, we, we know that budgets are, are, are moral and ethical documents, budgets reflect the ethical visions of the institution. How are we institutionalizing different sorts of voices in our strategic planning? Residencies and year long fellowships, they're, they're cool, they're important, but how are these voices at the very wheel that charts the direction that the ship will go? And if they're not, well, well why, right? Why are we not making room for that? In effect, the, these questions, I think, I hope, strike at the very core, the very heart of, of a central issue that I've tried to raise. Cultural expression for so many of us and so many of our traditions and traditions of the historically marginalized are precisely the mechanisms through which our communities have flourished and sustained, thrived. They reflect our truth claims in ways that nothing else can. This is what the arts do for us. What might it mean for those things to be valued gen genuinely, genuinely? I'll, I'll close somewhat returning to where we began. Part of the reason that international work is so important to me is that one finds such treasures in these earthen vessels, right? People, people I'm talking about, right? There, there's such beauty in the stories that communities tell, right? Larissa talked about this. And as I mentioned, I spend a good amount of time in the Arab world and in, in my journeys, travels, there's one family in particular that I'll, I'll lift up, the patriarch of which is a photographer. So when it came time for me to compile an artist roster uh, for the exhibition that I'm producing, 
at Harvard, this photography, this photographer was atop my list. So here we are, this 86 year old man, as his daughter says, whose father gifted him a camera as a 14 year old boy on the eve of when his entire family was displaced from their homeland, right? So on this young boy went from refugee camp to refugee camp to refugee camp, taking photos of those persons he encountered along the way. And, and, and they're, they're black and white photos and they are absolutely stunning. They're stunning. But because he spent his entire life as a poor man, He's never had the chance to display his work formally. So the show, his daughter tells me, has given them occasion to celebrate and grieve and honor and catalog and imagine and remember. This is what the arts do, right? They, they bring us back to ourselves and give us occasion to celebrate and grieve and honor and catalog and imagine and remember. It is in this way, I think, that honoring these things, not, not tokenizing them, but really really sitting, sitting with them, absorbing them, honoring them, and honoring these traditions that brings us, I think, a bit closer to being a little bit more, a little bit more robustly human. Thank you. Wow. That was absolutely amazing, Torian. Wow. <laughs> okay, I was lost, lost for words there. Um, absolutely amazing, Torian. Thank you so much for sharing, sharing that with us and just really making us think which is really important nowadays. Um, I, have a, I have a few questions for you. Um, so you mentioned rite of passage ceremonies and the significance it plays within your family unit. Um, as I asked Larissa, I'll ask you as well, how can we preserve rites of passage ceremonies and ensure its significance for generations to come? Yeah, yeah, no, so I, I appreciate that, that question. Uh, one one thing that that I always do is I when I when I come into any any space it's always important for me to foreground uh, the 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 people and the communities that um, that I bring into the space and that bring me into it right so I, I usually I didn't do it today but I, I sometimes call a roll call out names part of what that does for me is that it reminds me you know, pre precisely what I tried to highlight that 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 there is a tradition in which. I am situated. I'm in many, many traditions, right? You know, because people, we are, we are all uh, a, a a a mixture of of, of traditions and, and voices and histories, right? All all at once. For me, it's important to to call those things out, and and our, our children are young, uh, you know, and, and likely won't won't recall, you know, these these sorts of things uh, today. But but part of why things like the oral histories are so important, right? Not, not only from, from their parents, but also the, the elders who are still among us, right? Who, who are still among us be, being intentional about um, uh, grounding the intergenerational voice su such that, you know, those persons who will one day take our place on this earth um, will not forget. Agreed. Um, yes, I have another question. So you mentioned creative culture is key to our higher power, in a way key to us imagining new futures for ourselves. Um, and I wanted to ask, how can marginalized communities uh, or communities that have been disinvested in, um, you mm -hmm. know, how can we utilize creative culture um, and our sense of community for liberation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so again, that's, that's an excellent question. I mean, you know, one kind of low-hanging fruit answer is, is really to, to champion um, the, the arts in, in these communities, in the, art, the arts broadly, 
right? You know, there, there are, j just as there are a range of different learning styles, right? There are also a range of different um, access points to, to truth claims and, and to um, exercising our own truth claims in, in, the, in the earth, in the universe, right? Um, mm -hmm. Whether that's the performative arts, creative arts, the writing, um, the, the visual arts, you know, which, which is, uh, you know, has a, a special place in, in my heart, um, music, um, to, to champion these things in, in our communities, right? And, and, and in particularly under-resourced and underrepresented communities um, and, 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 to not, and to not forsake that work. Right, and, and by not forsaking, I mean it has to be more than just having a one-off conversation in certain in, in community of your choice, saying you know, hey, take this seriously. But what what sort of longitudinal scaffolding are you working towards keeping in place, right? So, such that um, when the conversation ends, the work still continues, right? So that that's that's one kind of pr practical thing uh, that that requires. Uh, human capital and dollars, frankly, right? So we look to institutions here, uh, among, among others. But the, the other kind of more, uh, maybe, maybe more general and more, more abstract point is, um, it is, in my estimation, it is in the very act of, uh, of doing, right? Of, of creating, in particular, that that, 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 it, that is the sacred work. Our creative products are the things that reflect, and in my estimation, that, that reflect the, the, the sacredness embedded necessarily in humanity, all of humanity, right? As, a, as opposed to always having to go, going, going to, I'm a religionist by training, going to our sacred texts is, is important, like our sacred writings of our, of our religious tradition. That's important. But what, what does it mean, though, when communities, when, when the young of our communities in the present moment don't necessarily have the same sorts of connections to the sacred texts that, uh, that, that their foreparents did? Is their work any less sacred? Well, well no, right? You know, the, the, the work is finding, finding out, looking for, and assuming that in communities doing the work that brings them most to life, that that is where, that is where the sacred can be found. And, and, and that work, I think, and I, I, we, we see this in different social movements also, is part of this work that, that, that pushes forward these new visions, articulations of, of freedom and liberation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tori. That was just so and so insightful um, and just very, just very informative. Um, I, my last question I wanted to ask you is really regarding like your experience um, as a religion and public life fellow at Harvard. Um, and, you know, us, just as you discussed, you know, in your presentation, the importance of genuinely creating space or for these institutions to create space for you know marginalized voices and for their art to really shine, um, can you just share you know a little bit about your experience as as a as a fellow at Harvard and you know during this time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so two two things. I I, I do believe we are in a in a historical moment in the United States where all of our institutions are, uh, like I mentioned, are, are forced to, to think a little bit differently about how they choose to center, particularly black and brown voices, uh, be, because, be, because they're in crisis. They know, they know that they would be in crisis if they didn't, right? So, and, and, I, and I, I, I wanna say that explicitly, right? Be, because it has, it, it has never been the case. It's never been the case in, in this country's history uh, where, where any sort of change that had to do with centering voices that have been previously marginalized. N none of it has ever been grounded in the shifting of the moral compass. It's not how that works, right? Institutions are recognizing that they have to, right? 
with, with that being said, one one great value that that I've appreciated about uh, my my time uh, at at Harvard, um, and, and and specifically the uh, the the office, the, the department, which I'm I'm a fellow of religion and public life um, at at Harvard. They have been intentional, and in, in my experience, they have been intentional about centering, particularly um, marginalized voices. And, and my, my specific unit, religion, conflict, and, ple- and peace, has been specific, have been really intentional about centering um, Arab and Muslim voices globally, which is which is where par- partially where where my my research and teaching. Uh, is is situated, and I've appreciated that that intention. At at the same time, and, and this that's to their credit. At at the same time, um, at at the at the same time, there there is still the work. You know, we are we are when doing work in institutions as persons and bodies and voices that have historically not been. Not only have they not been centered, but the institution itself has not been founded for the purpose of centering those voices. Remember now, Harvard is older than the country. Think about that. Harvard is older than the United States, which which means that all of these conversations, these early U.S. conversations about colonialism, about you know why why uh, black and brown bodies. Are like lower of lower value than white and Euro bodies. All of these conversations that we talk about being present at the beginning of this country, Harvard was one of the important seats of that knowledge production, and, and it's a legacy, right, to this very day. Which which means for us that, in so far, and and I think I think this to be the case again with institutions broadly in this country, insofar as voices of the marginalized are recognized, tried to be centered, that's important work. It is also our responsibility, I think, in in those subject positions, in in those positions of marginalized voice, right? That, That we continue to hold these institutions accountable to the things that they claim to believe, right? Because if we don't, they won't. Right, uh, so that's uh, that 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 is part of that's part of one of my my commitments. And again, I bring this back to the to the arts, to the cultural arts, which is why I think this is this is so important because it is a language uh, that 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 can be understood across so many different communities and, and groups, um, and an important source of empowerment. Yes, thank you so much, Torian. Everything you've said has just been so powerful um, and just very insightful. And thank you for you know sharing your experience at Harvard um, as as a fellow. Um, yeah, that that was absolutely wonderful. Um, so now uh, we can go ahead and just open it up to Q and A. Um, so for you all, you know, um, at in the audience, if you have any questions, this would be a great time to type them into the Q and A tab here down at the bottom of the screen. Uh, We have a few questions already. So we can go ahead. All right, and open it up to Larissa and Torian. All right, so for Q and A. All right, so the first question we have from Ray is, um, is the 15th of February particularly relevant to the tea ceremony? As a Brit, we drink tea a lot, not ceremony, but certainly with a ritual of tea and milk tea before milk. Um, so is the 15th of February particularly relevant to the to tea ceremony? Yes, the 15th of February is relevant to the tea ceremony because it was a ceremony started by enslaved Africans as a result that they were not able to celebrate on February 14th through due to them entertaining uh, the plantation owners guests on February 14th. So they were allowed to celebrate on February 15th. Some people also argue that it was a celebration started as a result of enslaved Africans being freed after the emancipation. But I guess at any rate, we can incorporate that in the story. But February 15th is the day that Africans 
um, enslaved Africans celebrate, yes, as a tea ceremony. Excellent. Um, we have two people who have raised their hands. Um, I'll go ahead and start with, uh, is it Marsha? That was me, yes. Yes. Hi. Hi. Mm -hmm. I just love this and I'm so, Miss Akamumi, you are so, I, I just love your presentation. Um, I know that what I, what I had, um, I mean, the history, do you have a book? Or is your book coming out? Because I would love to share this. Who is she speaking to? Miss Akawumi. Oh, I'm, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Uh -huh. I don't have a book as of yet. Uh -huh. um, this, this is part of a, an experiment. Um, of researching art and culture. Um, so I'm still developing as we speak, but who knows, maybe I can start a book. I think you should, because I think that, um, especially with Mr. Webb's presentation, the fact that we don't know where these ceremonies come from, and we always assume they come from the other rather right. than ourselves. And um, one of the things that I, uh, I'm 73 years old and um, going back to the black church, I mean, teas were a big thing in the black church. I mean, you, um, I remember Saturday nights, uh, everybody getting ready for the tea and everybody sewed, we were all poor, but your grandmother and your mother made hats and your little dresses and things like that. And oh my God, and the food was just out of this world. There was nothing like the tea cakes. And that's a traditional black thing. You know that. Yes. And I just, I'm, I'm, I'm just so excited because um, the, the thing was that when we lived in Ghana, my, the woman that took care of my daughter at the time, because I was working and my husband was working, she would sit tea with my daughter. And she, we carried that home with us now. Yes. And, she, and she told me in the village where she was raised, they didn't have anything to do with the others. They would have tea. So thank you. Thank you, you are so welcome. And thank you for sharing your tea story. Um, I would also ask um, if anyone has a personal tea story that they have, please, please tell it. Um, uh, share your stories because I I got a lot of stories. I I mean we can go on to about eight o'clock and I can tell you about my tea stories because you know how some people go to a, a liquor bottle. I go to tea. I love tea. Thank you. All right, I'll take one more um, raise hand and just so you all know, attendees, please direct your questions up to the Q and A. Uh, but go ahead, Tracy. Tracy? All right, well, we will come back. Tracy, if you are there, you can definitely go ahead and write your question in the Q&A. All right, so back to our Q&A. Our next question will be from Sharon Hart. How does African-American tea ceremonies differ from colonial ones? So, um, I, I would say, you know, that, that, that there really isn't too much of a difference, but traditionally not all African-American tea ceremonies have a, like a, a tea. Some of them might have just, you know, sandwiches and uh, like a pop um, and still might have the dresses, but there still are similarities. You still have the, the tea wares, you still have the dress it just, it, it might just be a, a, a simple time of day, you know, like there are lots of different, um, different types of tea times. There's 
high T, there's low T, there's, you know, like five different types of T times. The next question we have um, is from an anonymous attendee. Um, acknowledging the lineage and legacy that was shared in relation to tea traditions in Black life, I'm wondering if someone could speak to the social aspect of tea as shaped within Black queer culture. Um, I would say that there, there, there isn't um, much reference uh, to, to tea culture in, in, uh, in the queer community, but I do know that there used to be tea parties in Stonewall. Uh, so, so I do know that um, through my um, experience in dance culture. Um, but, you know, there was so much controversy with Stonewall and people are still uncovering um, uh, you know, uh, pieces of history. Um, not much was really archived back then that we're still coming up with new ideologies and new stories and new ways of living. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of the people that lived back in that time, many of them have died as a result of age, AIDS, but there were tea parties in Stonewall. And to me, that is the only indication of any type of tea ceremonies or tea parties that have been recorded in history. And as I said, we're still looking for um, new stories and new testaments, but I would say that most of the people that lived during that time, they're, they're in their 80s. Some of them are in their 90s. Um, so it's important to tell the story. If you don't tell the story, if you don't take a picture, it's not, it's not archived, it's, it's not recorded, it's not written down. That is very true, Larissa. Um, our next question is from Ashaka Holly. Are there any books or resources to gather more information about the African, African American tea ceremonies? So that is a tough question. They are not. All of my research has come from so many different places, um, from maps, from genealogy, from you know, um, records from other people that have written books that are non um, people of color that did have little excerpts of, you know, information uh, through different web articles, magazines, so forth and so on. There is not an actual book on record that talks about the African American ceremony from 450 BC to the present. <laughs> Maybe that could be a project that I do down the line, but it, there is none of, of record as of yet. Larissa, you should. I definitely feel that our audience is affirming you and that this is something that is needed. Um, we, we need the knowledge, we need to share it and spread it. So you should definitely do that. Okay. Um, our next question is from Amandillo Cousin. Larissa, do you have any insight into the current economics of the tea industry? What role does tea cultivation play in the economies of various African countries? And, and can you repeat the last part of the question? Yes. What role does tea cultivation play in the economies of various African countries? Um, hmm, that's interesting. So, so I do know that in Sudan, they, they do have tea carts. Um, I don't know if you all saw in the movie where there are these tea ladies that um, craft and curate your tea experience um, on the street and on the beaches. Um, they do sell, it's kind of like tea service, you know, they'll, like four people will come and they'll give you four, piece, four cups of crafted tea and little tea glasses and you can add um, sugar and mint or, you know, honey to taste. Um, that serves as the, the economy for the women in the Sudan. Now, other uh, countries, um, they do serve it on corners, but they're more apt to use it as social practice more than, um, more than selling it. 
I do know that in some countries, um, in, in Mauritania, you can go on the corner and get a cup of tea and conversation for 10 cents. And there are little children who actually, um, I showed a picture of a little girl sitting um, in the Sudan who sells tea also for $10, not $10, 10 cents. So um, I, don't, I don't think that they use it as a primary source for income. Um, like it's not like, like they have tea shops or tea salons here in the Americas, but I do know that some um, people do use it uh, like in the Sudan culture um, to sell tea on carts. All right, so the next would be a tea story uh, from Shaka Holly, and I hope I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Yes, um, okay, um, she states, for my 30th birthday, I gathered a few girlfriends and we went tea tasting at a local tea shop. We learned the history of tea. They left out the African, African-American history and tasted several teas. We were able to purchase some beautiful tea where it was a great birthday. Oh, wow. Thank you, Shaka. Thank you, Shaka. Hey, Shaka. <laughs> um, our next uh, question, or I think it's a tea story, is from Urban Innovation Center. I'm remembering how my grandmother would tell her stories over a cup of tea on Sundays after church and how many cups she could garner from just one tea bag. So the story stretched on. Today's discussion has made me recognize that as a ritual. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Urban Innovation Center. All right. Are there any more questions from our audience? And also, we have Torian here who also, you know, can have some questions. <laughs> Okay, Rose Hannon says that um, if she can ask, well, we know you are. Um, thanking Reverend Torian for including ADOS and some African artists in his Harbor show. However, in my research and expanding my own uh, BIPOC gallery, I've noticed a lot of African diaspora artists getting more breaks than our, our ADOS artists. How can we protect our ADOS artists? What does ADOS mean? Okay, sorry. Hey, uh, hey, Rose. Hey, Chaka, by the way. It's my people right there. Um, uh, and that, this is a clarification question. Rose, are you talking about uh, our Af artists across the diaspora, African diaspora artists? Could that be what ADOS means? I'm not quite sure. African descendants of slaves. Oh, okay. So kind of, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I think hmm, that that's a great, that's a great question. So one, one thing that, that I would kind of continue from what, what I, what I tried to start to mention earlier is, uh, really just try, trying to be intentional about, um, like being intentional about seeking voices across the the African diaspora, particularly black black US artists. So one thing about our show uh, that, that we try to to do is is be intentional about that. So so I have uh, I do have a couple of artists um, uh, you know who who are uh, who self-identify one self-identifies as, as Ghanaian. Um, I think one self-identifies as Sudanese. I have a uh, an Afro-Hawaiian sister. Um, I have two African American black US artists. Um, and, and maybe a couple, a couple other that I'm, a uh, couple others that, that I'm, that two, two or three Black U.S. artists, couple that, that I'm missing. So I think two, two, two parts of that question there, Rose. One, um, at, at one at an institutional level, is I, I think I'm um, just con continuing to to press that question of you know who who is represented. Why, why does it seem that certain voices are, are represented over over others, um, and not and not just in the in in what we produce, i.e., in our shows, but who's represented again at, at the decision making tables? Who who are the voices that are that are that are um, taking up space 
as we are making decisions about which artists we're going to center or choose, so on and so forth. That's the institutional conversation question. The, the other is a little bit more, um, uh, it might, might also be institutional, might be kind of not, it is really try to be intentional about um, going to where artists are. You know, one, and this, this, is, this isn't uh, a uniquely arts world conversation. I mean, we're talking about this in, in higher education. It's a, it's a, it's a question of recruitment. You, know, you, you can't talk about the field being skewed uh, if at the same time you're, you're not going in, into the, the, the places where, where folks are. You know, so where, you know, we, what, what we know is that creative production is happening in all of these communities, right? We, we know that. The, the question then becomes, where are we not going? Why are we not going there? And what needs to happen in order for us to, uh, to, to get there? Um, and you know, that's a it's sp specific, I think that's one of the specific solutions that, that could help us intervene in uh, the, the conversation. If, if I'm hearing what you're asking correctly, Rose, uh, where not, not only where are the black, U.S. artists, but how are we making sure that we do right by them? Thank you, Alpha and Bhutan. Thank you, Everson Art Center and everyone who joined us today. Um, thank you all for your questions. I hope this was an amazing experience. Um, it's really important for, for Black people uh, to tell their own stories and to tell um, their history. And I just hope that everyone really enjoyed the experience that we curated for you today. And I also want to really note um, how accessible this curated experience was today, it is today. Uh, we have our ASL interpreter, we had captions. Um, and I just want you all to go forward and, and just really, you know, take thought, you know, how can we ensure that art is accessible for all people, um, not just able bodies, but for everyone. And if you don't know, I'm disabled, I have one hand, very, you know, passionate about accessibility. Um, so again, thank you all for attending um, this curated experience today. And we really look forward um, for you all to join us for our next public programming. Um, please look out, you know, for us on the Everson Art Center uh, website, um, the Everson Art Center Curatorial Fellowship to find out, find out more about our public programming. Um, you can follow myself um, on Instagram at adaronot or my, uh, my company website at AK Prosthetics for All. Um, you also can follow uh, my co-curator um, partner in this fellowship, um, Alpha and Bruton at Phantom Gallery um, Chicago on Instagram. Um, so yeah, thank you all again. Um, hope you all, everyone enjoyed it. And yeah, that will be all for the show today. All right, everyone, love you guys, be safe.